I'm proud to say that today's video is brought to you by Magellan TV. This is the new documentary streaming service which was created by actual filmmakers and their studios to showcase their passion for a variety of topics. Magellan TV has an incredible library of movies, documentaries, and exclusive playlists. This includes content on biographies, science, crime, and my favorite, history, which happens to come in a variety of eras from the ancient all the way to the modern. The content is brought to you without interruption or ads and is available in 4K without any additional cost. I personally enjoyed their documentary on the Ottomans, which showed what the world was like during their rise to power. Their video series on Byzantium and the Crusaders was equally inspiring. I also like the idea that the videos can be watched anywhere and on any platform, including my phone. Now if you click on the link below, you can not only help out my channel, but you can also get your first month free. So hit that link and begin your journey with Magellan TV today. And now for the video you've been waiting for. It was the year 628. The emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire, Heraclius, had much to celebrate. He had pulled off a stunning victory and had saved his people when it seemed that all hope was lost. Now the fortunes of his empire had waxed and waned. Indeed, under one of his predecessors, the Emperor Justinian, the Eastern Romans, who would one day be referred to as the Byzantine, had achieved greatness in their land holdings in what was referred to as the Renovatio Imperii, the restoration of the empire. But since that time, misfortune had descended. The empire was engulfed in internal dissension, massive political upheaval, and was beset on all sides by determined and aggressive enemies. John Julius Norwich, in his A Short History of Byzantium, a mere 400 pages long, explains the situation that Heraclius stepped into at the beginning of his reign. Quote, at the age of 36, fair-haired and broad-chested, Heraclius must have appeared something of a demigod when he stepped out of the palace, his young wife on his arm. Yet, there were surely many of his subjects who feared that he might be the last emperor of Byzantium. Never had any of his predecessors inherited so desperate a situation. To the west, the Avars and the Slavs had overrun the Balkans. To the east, the Persian watchfires were clearly visible at Chalcedon, immediately across the Bosphorus. True, the Theodosian walls were in good repair and the Persians had no ships by which to cross the straits. But though the capital was secure, the provinces were falling away. The year after Heraclius' ascension, the Persians had seized Antioch. In 613, they added Damascus, and in 614, Jerusalem. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre was burnt to ashes, the True Cross was seized. The Persians then turned their attention to taking Egypt, and before long the chief source of the empire's corn had become a Persian province. Famine and pestilence soon followed." End quote. In 622, after initially suffering major setbacks, Heraclius began a series of military campaigns that stabbed deep into the Persian Empire. Within six years, he had concluded several successful campaigns. His forces had smashed Persian armies, had won a decisive victory at the Battle of Nineveh in 627, and soon Heraclius had his men take up position near the Persian capital, Tessaphon. The Persian king, Khosrau II, was overthrown and some say murdered by his own son, Kavid II who, recognizing the extremely poor situation that he was in, immediately sued for peace. The lost lands in Mesopotamia, the Levant, Egypt, Syria, and Asia Minor were restored to the Romans. Jerusalem was once again in Christian hands, and the True Cross was returned. An end to hostilities could not have come at a better time. The Byzantine and the Persian empires, which some historians have referred to as the eyes of the known world, 
had battled one another into sheer exhaustion. But this prolonged and destructive war was further complicated by major famine and then plague, the effect of which reduced both empires to a shadow of their prior strength. However, this peace that they had shed so much blood for was not to last, for a new power was about to enter the world stage. Far to the south of these two great empires, in the deserts of Arabia, a people who were essentially disregarded as nothing more than simple barbarians, a military annoyance at best, had united together into one of the most formidable fighting forces, and they were now poised to unleash one of the greatest conquests the world had ever seen. John Norwich gives us the unfolding story, quote, On September 14th in the year 628, Heraclius entered his capital in triumph. Before him went the true cross behind four elephants, the first ever seen in Constantinople. Though still only in his middle fifties, he looked old and ill, but if he had worn himself out, he had done so in the service of empire. Thanks to him, Persia would never again threaten Byzantium. The procession thread its way to St. Sophia. During the Thanksgiving service that followed, the true cross was slowly raised up until it stood vertical before the high altar. It was, perhaps, the most moving moment in the history of the great church, and many saw it as a sign that a new golden age was about to dawn. Alas, it proved to be nothing of the kind. Just six years before, in September 622, the year Heraclius had launched his Persian expedition, the Prophet Muhammad had fled from hostile Mecca to friendly Medina, thereby initiating the Muslim era. And by 633, the armies of Islam would begin the advance that was to take them in the course of a single century to within 150 miles of Paris and to the very gates of Constantinople." End quote. The very next year, in 629, Heraclius was on pilgrimage to Jerusalem to place the true cross back in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. While he was making his journey, a letter reached him. Now the contents of this letter cannot be reliably confirmed, and by some accounts the entire encounter could simply be apocryphal. But if it is to be believed, it read, In the name of Allah, the most beneficent and the most merciful, this letter is from Muhammad his apostle to Heraclius, the ruler of the Romans, peace be upon the followers of guidance. I invite you to surrender to Allah, embrace Islam, and Allah will bestow on you a double reward. But if you reject his invitation, you will be misguiding your people. Heraclius had no idea where this threat was coming from, but he was soon to find out. Nearly 20 years before, in the year 610, a man named Muhammad, soon to be considered by his people as the messenger of God, was regarded to have received divine revelations. Albert Hurani, in his History of the Arab Peoples, gives one account of what happened. Quote, he became a solitary wanderer among the rocks, and then one day, perhaps when he was about 40 years old, something happened some contact with the supernatural, known to later generations as the Knight of Power or Destiny. In one version, an angel seen in the form of a man on the horizon called to him to become the messenger of God. He heard the angel's voice summoning him to recite, and he asked, What shall I recite? End quote. According to Islamic tradition, Muhammad then became the prophet of God. Being illiterate himself, he committed the words he recited to memory. And in time, these words were written down by others to create the Quran, which the very name itself means to recite. This was to be the holy book of a new religion, that of Islam. The Prophet began to preach his divine Islamic revelation. His discourse attracted both a following of people and the disdain of the entrenched religious establishment. This came to a breaking point in the year 622, the same year Heraclius was about to initiate his great campaigns against the Persians. It was that year that the Prophet Muhammad fled with his supporters from Mecca to the city of Medina, a journey that would be known as the Hijra and marked the beginning of the Islamic calendar. Once in Medina, Muhammad established a stronghold and gained a powerful following. Eight years later, when he was sufficiently well-funded and reinforced, he returned and conquered Mecca in 630. 
Upon hearing of this conquest and the words that he preached, the quarreling and disunited tribes of Arabia began to flock to his banner. Under Islam, they were united and instilled with a fierce resolve to expand their domain. Indeed, by the time of his death in 632, Muhammad had brought nearly all of Arabia under his control. But it was his immediate successors, known as the Rashidun Caliphs, or the Rightly Guided, that would elevate the Islamic conquest to a new level. By the early 630s, Arab forces, now well disciplined and organized, ventured out from the great deserts of the Arabian Peninsula. Now at first, these were no more than simple raids or skirmishes into Mesopotamia and Syria, but soon it became an all-out invasion. It was not long until both the beleaguered and exhausted empires of the Eastern Romans and the Persians came under full attack. After the fall of Damascus and much of the Levant to Arabian armies in 634, Heraclius decided to assemble a large army to confront this new and rather unexpected threat. The Persians, who were equally caught off guard by the Arabian onslaught and were reeling from several defeats, did exactly the same thing. In a somewhat rare event, the Romans and the Sassanian Persians decided to focus their militaries on their common enemy rather than each other. In the critical year of 636, the Byzantine and the Persian forces engaged the Caliphate in two separate major battles. At the Battle of Yarmouk in August, the Byzantine army was utterly destroyed. A sandstorm had blinded them just as a well-timed Arabian cavalry charge crushed their flank. A few months later in November, at the Battle of al qadisiyah the Persian army was equally annihilated when their general was slain on the field of battle and morale collapsed. The path was now open for the armies of Islam to continue their conquest. To the east, the armies of the Caliphate now poured into Persia. They traversed the Zagros Mountains and pursued the Persian armies across the Iranian plateau, eventually taking the culturally and militarily important city of Isfahan in 642. That same year, the Sassanid king Yazdegerd III deployed a massive army to stop the invaders. But at the Battle of Nahavand, the warriors of the Rashidun Caliphate, despite being outnumbered nearly three to one, pulled off a decisive victory. The Persian army was destroyed, and with its destruction, the Sassanian Persian Empire began to collapse. But the Persian spirit was still strong, and it would take the Arabs until 651 to complete their conquest. However, by that time, the King of Kings, Yazdegerd III, was reduced to a beggar, wandering the wilderness. And if the story of his death is to be believed, he was betrayed and murdered by a common miller while simply looking for food. The Arab conquest of the East would continue, and by 750, the borders of the Caliphate would rest within the Indus River Valley, along the same frontier once seen by Alexander the Great. But the Persians were not alone in feeling the wrath of the Caliphate. To the west, the Romans would also watch their empire crumble. Fresh from their conquest of Mesopotamia and their stunning victories at both Yarmouk and al qadisiyah Arabian armies now also moved to the west and to the north. Gaza and Antioch were taken in 637, Jerusalem in 638. By 641, most of the Levant was in Muslim hands and Syria had also fallen, forcing the emperor Heraclius to lament, Farewell, a long farewell to Syria, my fair province. Thou art an infidels now. Peace be with you, O Syria. What a beautiful land you will be for the enemy's hands. The Caliph's men would push on into Armenia and then into Asia Minor. But here, the forces of the Roman Emperor were at last able to slow them down. By the mid-7th century, a neutral zone of sorts was created along the breadth of the Tarsus Mountains. However, even as the grain fields of Anatolia were spared for the moment, a new front had already been opened. From their staging areas in the Levant, an Islamic force of a mere 4,000 was sent into Egypt in 639. Later, heavily reinforced, this army took the vital port city of Alexandria in 641 and the rest of Egypt the next year. 
From there, the Islamic conquest would continue along North Africa into the Maghreb. The ancient city of Carthage, which was razed to the ground at the end of the Third Punic War, and then resurrected by Julius Caesar a hundred years later, was taken in 698. Tangier in modern-day Morocco was captured two decades later in 708. Now the Caliphate stretched from the Indus River Valley on one end to the Atlantic Ocean on the other. Edward Gibbon gives his account of the Muslim general named Akba, who pushed the western borders of the Caliphate to the ocean. Quote, the fearless Akba plunged into the heart of the country, traversed the wilderness, and at length penetrated to the verge of the Atlantic and the Great Desert. The career, though not the zeal, of Akba was checked by the prospect of a boundless ocean. He spurred his horse into the waves and, raising his eyes to heaven, exclaimed, Great God, if my course were not stopped by the sea, I would still go on to the unknown kingdoms of the West, preaching the unity of the holy name and putting to the sword any rebellious nations." End quote. From North Africa, Islamic forces would cross the Strait of Gibraltar and Europe would be invaded in 711. What was once the Roman province of Hispania was then a Visigoth kingdom. However, it was on the verge of civil war and proved to be an easy target. It was rapidly overrun and became the Caliph's newest province, which the Arabs would call Al-Andalus. But despite losing so much land, it was perhaps the Caliphate's development of a navy that most sent chills into the Roman emperors. The great harbor of Alexandria in Egypt, along with several other major ports in the Levant, were now in the service of the Caliph. With an urge to continue the holy war on the water, a navy was constructed. However, it would be over a decade before these ships would be a serious challenge to the Eastern Romans. But once unleashed, this new Muslim navy would quickly prove itself. The island of Cyprus and then Rhodes fell to the Caliphate in 654. The loss of these two strategic islands prompted the Roman Emperor Constans II to launch his own fleet with the intent to intercept the Muslims. Off the coast of Asia Minor in late 655, the two forces met. At what would later be known as the Battle of the Masts, the Romans were decisively beaten and the path to Constantinople was now laid open. However, a rapid advance on the city did not occur. In 661, civil war would come to the Caliphate. In what was known as the First Fitna, the Rashidun Caliphs were overthrown, and a new and very powerful dynasty was established, that of the Umayyad. The capital of the Caliphate was now moved to Damascus, where a new objective was determined. It was the dream of the first Umayyad Caliph, Muawiyah, to finally conquer Constantinople. Roger Crowley expertly explains his conviction, quote, The velocity of conquest was staggering, the ability to adapt extraordinary. Driven by the word of God and divine conquest, the people of the desert constructed navies to wage the holy war by sea. Finally, in 669, within 40 years of Muhammad's death, the Caliph Muawiyah dispatched a huge amphibious force to strike a knockout blow at Constantinople itself. On the wind of victory, he had every anticipation of success." End quote. The plans for this conquest were meticulous and designed with a long siege in mind. The Muslim navy was sent up past the Dardanelles to secure ports, dry dock facilities, and establish supply depots within the Sea of Marmara. The fleet would eventually serve to blockade Constantinople, slowly tightening their stranglehold. The armies of the Caliphate were then brought up and took up position to the east, within sight of the city on the Asian shore. More and more reinforcements arrived, and in 674, they established a formidable siege line along the western side of the city. But once again, the Theodosian walls were the saving grace of the Romans. The siege technology of the time was simply not adequate to breach these impressive fortifications, and the Muslim besiegers knew this. Now the exact details of what happened next are still a bit unknown. Some claim that for the next four years until 678 this was a continuous siege, whereas other sources state that the Umayyad adopted a containment strategy with multiple coordinated raids. 
Either way, had this continued, the city might have been taken. But at this point in history, the Byzantine had developed a new superweapon. And just as things turned out, they found themselves in a target-rich environment. In 678, the Byzantine fleet sailed from their safe harbor in the Golden Horn. The siege had been going on for four years, and so by this time, their spy network had revealed the logistical network of their enemy. They knew exactly where they were headed. Using extreme caution to maximize on the element of surprise, the fleet made its way to the main Umayyad naval base in the Sea of Marmara, which many believe to be the port city of Sisychus. The ships were known as Dromans. They were light and swift and manned by many oars. On board was a relatively new weapon, which its composition is still highly debated to this day. By some references, the Byzantine had come up with a way to store within a bronze container a mixture which mainly consisted of crude oil for its flammability and pine resin for its adhesive properties. But the true genius was that the Eastern Romans had figured out a way to effectively weaponize this mixture. Using a hand pump to build up pressure, the volatile mixture was forced through a movable hose and nozzle, and thus the attacker could maneuver it in whichever direction they wished. Now just as the mixture came out, it was ignited by a flame into a jet of fiery death. This was medieval napalm, and the Droman was essentially a massive flamethrower. Later historians would refer to this as Greek fire and would debate its composition to this day. But what cannot be debated was its effect on the Muslim fleet, which was both quick and decisive. Crowley again explains, quote, The explosion of flame was accompanied by a noise like thunder. Smoke darkened the sky and steam and gas suffocated the terrified sailors on the Arab ships. The firestorm seemed to defy the laws of nature. It could be directed sideways or downward in whichever direction the operator wished. Where it touched the surface of the sea, the water ignited. It seemed to have adhesive properties too, sticking to wooden hulls and masts and proving impossible to extinguish, so that the ships and their crews were rapidly engulfed in a propulsive torrent of fire that seemed like the blast of an angry god." End quote. This naval attack would be repeated again and again. The Umayyad fleet would be systematically hunted down and destroyed, and with its loss, their system of logistics was crippled. The besiegers of Constantinople soon began to run out of food, and in time the siege had to be lifted. But even as the Muslims tried to make their way back, many of their remaining ships were wrecked in a sudden storm. Their army fared no better. The Caliph's men were caught in Anatolia by a Byzantine ambush and were annihilated. This was a stunning reversal of fortune to an Islamic conquest that had otherwise seen very little setback. Of the men that were ordered to Constantinople, only a fraction returned. Thus, the Caliph, Muawiyah, had to settle in 679 on unfavorable terms. And so heavy did he carry this failure that he died a year later in a state of complete disillusionment. Here, Islam had faced a major defeat, but it would not be the last time that the Caliphate would test the walls of Theodosius II. The great city on the Bosphorus had become more than a symbol of defiance. It had become an obsession. Nearly 40 years later, a new Umayyad Caliph dispatched an even greater army to take Constantinople. Alongside the long line of soldiers on the march, sailed a fleet so large that it would dwarf the one sent before. A great siege in the pages of history was about to begin, and Constantinople would once again be put to the test for its very survival. 